Everybody. Welcome to Pop Culture Curiosities. My name is Avery Vandenhouten. I am an indie filmmaker who talks about nostalgic, obscure, or otherwise strange content on the internet. And this is the podcast where I get my friends from the industry and tell them stories about the weird goings on of popular Hollywood movies or just strange things that have happened in pop culture. Today, I'm joined by Gabriel Kustick. Do you want to introduce yourself if they don't know who you are, Gabe? <laughs> Hi. I'm Gabriel Kustick. I'm a backgrounder slash <laughs> slash uh, novice YouTuber, and I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> He's like, Avery's holding me against my will. <laughs> <laughs> She's not. <laughs> I want to be here. So, okay. For this first, this is the first episode that we've done. So if it's extra scuffed, you know why. Um, we're going to try to be very easy on our producer, Spencer, who is monitoring sound and trying not to... <laughs> hurt any of us <laughs> thank um, you spencer <laughs> thank you spencer please don't hurt us um but um okay we're gonna go back in time i wanted to say we're not gonna go too far back in time for this first time um we're going back to 2002 that's over 20 years ago I, it hit me so uh yeah does isn't that hurtful to think about <laughs> i was eight <laughs> I, am now, <laughs> I am now 28 so <laughs> Yeah, I so we're going 21 years in the past almost um to a film set in LA. So, I know this room looks like a cramped little closet, but it is actually a TARDIS. Um I this is how I decided to tell you. So, oh. we are going to go all the way back, get it get in the TARDIS or if you prefer a DeLorean or what have you, get in <laughs> get in loser, we're going to 2002. <laughs> So, oh, look at that. Uh, oh, my whoa. God. Oh, my God. The sound effects. Can you hear that? They're definitely not in post. They're, they're here live. I can live. hear them very clearly. Thank, th thank you, lights. <laughs> 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 okay, so it's 2002. We're here. Whoa. It's California. We're on a small sound studio on a soundstage. Um and uh, imagine that we had like an early call time, you and me. We've both been there. Early call time, right? <laughs> How early are we talking? I've had four a or I think 5 a.m. was my earliest. I don't believe that early yet, but I think like 7 a.m. I think. Um, <laughs> seven. Yeah. Let's say seven or seven, I think. Um, the director insisted that we're all here early, um, but it's like afternoon and the director is not here yet. <laughs> And neither is who will come to find out is his best friend, who is also the line producer, the guy who does all the scheduling, the blah, 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 like does a million different jobs. The, neither of them are here. So we're all just sitting around being like, why the hell are we out of bed and here? <laughs> um, and then eventually the director shows up, right? And he shows up and he immediately starts yelling at everybody, even though he's like four or five hours late. He's like yelling at everybody to stop stop standing around and getting to work and you know telling everybody that they the producers that no one has met <laughs> wants to see his friend on camera and by later that day um he has fired the lead actor um besides him because he's the lead actor and he has replaced him with said best friend um this is how the crew got to know for the kind of the first time tommy wiseau and greg sestero uh, Tommy Wiseau is the main chaos <laughs> agent in the story. Um, this is uh, the story of the making of The Room, which is known as the Citizen Kane of bad movies. Tommy Wiseau is pretty much responsible for all the crazy shit that happened on this movie set. Greg Sestero kind of got hijacked along for this ride and just kind of ended up here and was like, why am I here? <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing? Why? Yeah. So I'm going to tell you this story. Um... A lot of it comes from Greg Sestero's book, The Disaster Artist, which they later made a movie about. Um, it won awards, ironically, even though the movie that it's based off of did not. <laughs> um, 
But yeah, um, before we get into this video, we'd like to thank our sponsors. Uh, nobody. We don't have sponsors. But if you'd like to sponsor us, you We're can sponsor here. us. I don't know. I'm looking at this camera. I don't know what I'm looking at over here. I'm looking at this <laughs> camera, but this camera can't see me. Um, why don't they have sponsors? Uh, <laughs> please sponsor us so this adorable origami dinosaur can be fed. <laughs> Because we don't have food for them right now. What's that dinosaur's name? Steve. Oh. Do you want Steve to go hungry? <laughs> Insert uh, royalty-free Sarah McLaughlin music. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> for, to, for just one or two or ten sponsors a day, we can feed Steve. <laughs> and he Steve's would... like, don't drag me into this. <laughs> Steve just like, <laughs> Steve's just like, no, I'm Bill. This is Steve. Oh no, you mixed up your children. <laughs> oh no, my my 35 children. Please help me feed my 35 children. So, fun thing about Greg Sestero, when Greg Sestero was 12 years old, um, in 1990, he saw Home Alone on Christmas Day for the first time. And being the kid that he was, who was, even then, knew he wanted to be an entertainer, he went home and he actually wrote a screenplay for Home Alone 2, Lost in Disneyland, is what he called it. Um, it starred Macaulay Culkin and himself, who was a friend of, uh, you know, Kevin McAllister. And they were lost in Disney World after Kevin takes the wrong plane, which, by the way, that is they, he didn't go to Disney World. <laughs> but in the second one, when they did make it, he did get on a wrong plane. So I think Greg Sestero at 12 years old was on to something. I'm just saying. Um, but anyway, what happened was um, he did what all 12 year olds do after you write a screenplay and then score it and then make a um, promotional campaign complete with movie posters for this movie that doesn't exist. Um, he called information because it was 1990 and he asked for, I believe um, he asked for uh, 20th Century Fox. He actually got somebody there. Um, but it, it did not lead to anything, if you can believe that. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> I know. But bless his heart, he then was like, I need to get through to John Hughes himself. The, you know, the the main, you know, the main guy but behind Home Alone. So he uh, called and sent, he actually sent the uh, manuscript to John Hughes Production Studio. And weeks later, he actually got the manuscript back with a note from John Hughes basically saying like, no, thank you, but also don't give up because, you know, you really have, you know, you really have the potential to do whatever you want. It was very sweet. He says it was something that he kept his entire life. And basically like he didn't, he always wanted to be an actor, but his family, like his, his mom specifically was not very supportive. Like she was, um, she was uh French Sicilian. So she was an immigrant. So like, she didn't like the idea of like, her son struggling like you know that's pretty understandable like we work in the film industry the film industry is not what you would call reliable <laughs> <laughs> that being <laughs> sorry that that being an understatement the laugh the laugh of no it's it's would you say your job is reliable <laughs> 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 you're not even it's not even it might not even be reliable the day of you could get in there and they're like oh we don't need you Goodbye without pay. <laughs> I was booked one time to do a photo double gig and I got there and they already had a photo double for that character. Um, so they just stuck me in the back. And eventually, at the very last scene of the day, I got to be a background. <laughs> um, but I just did nothing for 12 hours of the rest of that day. Oh, gosh. I remember I was on a show and and I was I was booked to work this scene and Basically, they had the director come through and basically yay or nail the background. And there were a lot of us there. And so the director would go up to you like this. And if he went like this, you're in the scene. But if he just went to the next person without doing that, you weren't in the scene and he didn't do that. And I was basically stuck there for 15 hours. I knew I wasn't going to work. And there were people who were like, can we leave? And they're like, if you do, we're going to blacklist you. Oh, my God. It's like the uh, the Thanksgiving Day dog show where like the, the, the trainer goes by and like points to dogs that she thinks should make the next round. I just hit the microphone. I'm sorry. But no, it's like it's like the um, it's like the the you know, the Thanksgiving Day dog show where it's like they just point at dogs that they think should make the next round. It's like, uh, but these are people like <laughs> that's basically what happened. And I was just like <laughs> and just just the the level of like rejection that I felt in that oh. moment. And I'm just sitting and holding and people are leaving, coming back. And I'm just like, 
well, thanks. I know. <laughs> and yeah, I know I'm usually shoved into the back because I get a big red fro. So it's it's always great when it's like people are like, oh, your fro's good for the 80s. And then I go on an 80s shows and they're like, hi, you know how you're in like the very back of the background? You can step out for this scene. You're kind of too distinct. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah. So yeah, reliability, none. Yeah. So Greg Sestero in like right out of high school, he knew this kind of unreliability um, he actually got cast to be a to do some modeling and he actually got to travel to like France and Italy and he had a really good experience modeling. Um, but he wanted to be an actor and people are like, you can't it's hard to transfer from one to the other. But a buddy kind of got him in with his an agent that he knew back in L.A. who basically said, like, get some experience acting, get some training and then we'll talk because you do you do have like a, a certain quality as a je ne sais quoi, <laughs> if you Ooh. will. Um those weren't her words, but that basically that's what she told him. So he goes about like taking like every like um, basically every job that will pay him to do stuff. He goes on like every extras gig, every like bit part, anything that he can get while he's still um, in San Francisco where he grew up. Um, six months goes by and he's finally like he's he's um, you know, he's started taking some classes. You know, he's he's gotten a little bit of like experience on set under his belt and he thinks he's ready to maybe move to L.A. And then what had happened was the agent's office had called his home back and accidentally got his mother on the phone. And if you remember, his mother does not like the idea of her son uh, going to L.A. to act. So she um, screamed at the assistant and basically the agent wanted nothing to do with him after this kerfuffle. Um, yeah. And it was like a huge deal for him. But he kept working. <laughs> he did not give up. And he eventually enrolled in an acting class where he would eventually meet Tommy Wiseau. And he had no idea how his whole life was going to flip upside down <laughs> after this. It's a little story of how his life got flipped, turned upside down. His mom got in one little fight and everybody got scared. <laughs> and he decided that I'm going to be shipping myself off to L.A. over there. Something like that. But there's a there's a step in between there. So in 1998... It is now 1998. So basically, he's in this class and he hears this um, classmate of his that he's known because, again, his mother is part French. Uh, so he's bilingual. He knows French and he's spoken to this guy who's French and they've had like conversations. They like bonded over being French. Um, and he's hearing this guy speak French and he thinks he's talking to him and he looks and he's not talking to him. He's talking to this guy who is very acting, very put out by the idea of being spoken to in French like this guy is like trying to get his attention and being like oh like you you know are you French are you French and the guy is just kind of like not at all interested in him come to find out this is Tommy Wiseau Tommy Wiseau is um if you know anything about Tommy Wiseau I feel like a lot of people do uh you do the Tommy Wiseau voice very well so I know you know how Tommy <laughs> Wiseau his accent he's got a very like thick like Eastern European nobody can really place it accent um, you will find out about Tommy Wiseau that whenever anybody asks him, like, you know, oh, where are you from? Um, he does not like to really say he doesn't like to say where he made his money, which is a substantial amount of money. He does not like to say where he was from um, when he when he when he's asked and pressed for details. He's been known to say um, New Orleans <laughs> and it's he clearly does not have a New Orleans accent. Like it's it's totally fine. But like he clearly does not like talking about. um where he's from or like being from another country so nobody really knows where he's actually from i i can't tell you as much about him as greg because uh greg wrote a whole book and tommy wiseau doesn't want anybody to know how old he is um so you know it's his prerogative he, he that's just you know we just don't know um to, greg sestero actually describes his accent as eastern european that was hit by a parisian bus <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, yeah. you know, you know, um, somewhere in that general part of the world, um, we, we do know, we do know he's, he's told lots of different stories. When you ask him like how he made his money, um, it's, it's very much like, do you know, in Ratatouille where it's like, why, why'd you go to prison? That one guy. And he's like, the story's different every time. And he's like, I killed a man with this thumb. Like, you know, the story like keeps changing. That's basically Tommy 
talking about how he made his money. We do know that he had a clothing line. It appears that he had a clothing line called Street Style USA because there actually exists commercials that he made himself for this clothing company um, to become SAG eligible. Uh, and it involves him dressed as Hamlet quoting Shakespeare. To be or not to be? That is the question. The answer to be a street fashion. Be who you want to be in Levi's jeans from street fashions. To be or not to be? Who do you want to be? Your social skills aren't exactly streets ahead. That's the only, like, he sa said that he did everything from selling jeans, selling imported jackets, real estate, um, just all kinds of things, right? Like, no one knows who this guy is. Um, but we know that he has a lot of money, and he really wants to make movies. Um, Tommy, as much as he wanted to be um, in the acting business, he was uh, not a great student at the acting class where they were in. The teacher was always reprimanding him. He was always, like, you know, yelling and going way over the top in scenes. But somehow, for some reason, even though everybody else ignored Tommy, Greg asked him to be a scene partner, and they actually hit it off because, like, they both have a love of movies. They both have a passion for the industry. And, like, they became like frequent scene partners i'm not sure like if it was like a you pick one scene partner and that's your scene partner for the year kind of thing or what but they were basically scene partners a lot even though tommy was also not a good scene partner um one time uh they did a scene and greg gave what he felt was a lackluster performance and so he insisted that greg give him apology chocolates and he made sure that to tell him that they should be mint flavored <laughs> He was like, you need to buy me chocolates and they need to be mint because that's how badly I think you mess up our scene. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. It's like when the newbie backgrounds are like, um, I think we need to walk this fast. Or why would you do that during that scene? And it's yeah. just like, sweetie, sweetie. <laughs> it's going to be OK. Get it together. Greg also has a story about being over at Tommy's apartment to rehearse while they're still in San Francisco um, in this particular acting class. And. Tommy asks Greg, hey, do you want a drink? And Greg's like, yeah, OK, sure. And he proceeds to give Greg um, carrot juice from a bottle that was three months out of expiration date. And when Greg paid it, pointed out that this was three months expired carrot juice, he apparently Tommy apparently was quoted as saying, well, excuse me, the maid is out of town. <laughs> What? So Tommy's okay. really a character, is what I'm saying. Oh, uh, okay. Tommy is he's it, everything makes sense to Tommy in a very specific way, but very few people understand Tommy. And Greg kind of finds himself as he gets to know Tommy more, being kind of like the liaison between Tommy and everybody else. Um, eventually, they move to LA together. And were roommates in an apartment that Tommy had already owned. According to Greg, Tommy was also a terrible roommate on top of being a terrible scene partner. Um, he tells the story about one night he's in Greg is in his room sleeping. And Tommy allegedly opens the door to his bedroom because he had put in what was, I guess, before this, just a guest room. He had put like chin up, like a chin up bar on the door frame. So Tommy in the middle of the night opens Greg's door, scares the shit out of him, proceeds to do a bunch of chin-ups on the bar, then pace around in, like, the living space outside of his room, do more chin-ups, and then eventually, after he'd done a few repetitions, he closes the door and leaves without saying anything to Greg. And Greg is just like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this is going towards a horror movie kind of direction. <laughs> you would think, and for some people who have been working on, who worked on this film, they might agree with you. <laughs> I can't um, wait to see that horror film in the future. Oh, my God. They did bond over making movies. They had like a they both had such a passion for making movies. Um, Tommy really loves James Dean. If you've seen The Disaster Artist, you know anything about um, Tommy Wiseau. You probably know he really loves James Dean. Um, in fact, the the famous you're tearing me apart, Lisa, um, quote from The Room, which is the movie that he made, which I'm going to get it more into in a second, is... Um, it, it was supposed to be a ripoff of the line, you're tearing me apart from Rebel Without a Cause with uh, James Dean, but he did it wrong. 
so it became its own thing. He accidentally <laughs> didn't plagiarize, kind of. Um, but if you're wondering, like, who Tommy is, why you should care, like, most people will know this, like, going in, but Tommy Wiseau is the director, producer, star, writer, um, and basically all the other important things to uh, the movie called The Room, which is known as the Citizen Kane of bad movies. Um, I'm trying to wrap my mind around how best to tell you this because <laughs> I've I've written all kinds of notes and it's still like it's still there's no real describing. Well, there is, but it's hard to describe the room. Um, the room is. This is what I wrote in my notes. The room is supposed to be a slice of life drama about a banker who's being cheated on by his girlfriend who is sleeping with his best friend and eventually takes his own life. It's very sad. That's what it's supposed to be. Um, what the room actually is, is the most hilarious and bizarre film most people have ever seen. It tries so hard to be serious that it shoots the melodramatic moon and comes back around to being just the funniest thing ever. I don't think it's the, literally the worst movie ever because I cover weird stuff on the internet and I've seen some pretty bad movies that could at least rival it. But it's just known as being like the quintessential bad movie in every sense of the word. Tom Bissell, who co-wrote, uh, a.k.a. revised so it was legible, the script for The Room after Tommy had written it and after they were already on scene, try on set trying to film it, um, said, quote, It's like a movie made by an alien who has never seen a movie but has had movies thoroughly explained to them. So, so like the chat EGT or whatever it is? The what? Or like people enter... Like information to a chat oh, thing, and the AI thing. Yeah, that it's like someone someone put in, put a just various descriptions of what movies are into the AI, and this is what came out. Pretty much, um, characters' motivations change from moment to moment, have entirely inappropriate reactions to things. Ultimately, it makes no sense and has no plot. Some of my some of my favorite examples are um, when the mother of one of the main characters says completely nonchalantly to her, I got the results back from the doctor. I definitely have breast cancer. I think I remember yeah, seeing Yeah, that's a pretty that. famous line. Oh my gosh. Uh, there's another line where Tommy, who looks uh, very unique as a human person, he's got long black hair, he's got the sunglasses, he's, he's a, not a very unmistakable person. There's a scene where he walks into a flower shop and he is like buying roses for Lisa, his future wife, and the shop owner, like, halfway through this transaction is like, oh, Tommy, I didn't recognize it's you. You're my favorite customer. <laughs> and it's like, it doesn't make any sense. And fun fact, that scene, not to get too far ahead of myself, um, they filmed it on the last day of shooting, and all of the people in there, including the person who says, oh, hi, Johnny, you're my favorite customer, all of those people are were not hired by the set. They basically just walked into this, this, um, flower shop and started filming and somehow got away with that and in fact the oh hi doggy that also happens that scene it was improv because tommy wiseau did not believe that it was a real dog he asked them is it real and they're like is is the dog real yes like can you imagine you're just like doing your job working at just like a corner store and this guy comes in with like a couple of cameras and it's just like doesn't even say can we do this it's just like hey we're going to do this thing. And you're like, okay, um, <laughs> sure. And then they just leave. Like, like it's just, it's the most bizarre thing ever. It's so funny. Um, there's also several scenes where like um, characters in two big suits for them, like the suits are way too big on them. They're throwing footballs around for no reason. I rem I remember that being talked about and they're like talking about a wedding or something and they just never go to a wedding and they're just throwing a football. Yeah, Tommy Wiseau was asked once about why are they always playing football and he says football is just fun. <laughs> that was basically his <laughs> that was basically his way of explaining like yeah, football's fun. Why wouldn't they be playing football in tuxedos? <laughs> 
I don't know why I'm laughing. It's just a nervous response. I apologize if I laugh at an inappropriate moment. Oh no, you're good. It's this is a very this is a very silly story. Uh, there are some very um there are some very intense moments to the story, but this is very silly. Like Greg talks about again with the footballs. Like he's watching back on the on the monitor after they shoot the scene where they're just throwing around a football in tuxedos that don't fit them, and Greg's just like thinking, "This is so stupid. Like this is the word." And he looks over at Tommy. Tommy is apparently crying and he's just he says like this is it this is the American this is American male bonding and so that scene made it into the movie (laughs) a lot of a lot of the decisions made on this movie set were really just subject to two things it was Tommy Wiseau's ever-changing whims and what was usable footage, because a lot of it after at the end of the day, when all was said and done, it was not usable. And we'll get to that, too. Um, there's just a lot. Uh, there's just a lot. Tommy initially wrote The Room in 2001 as a play after seeing the talented Mr. Ripley and being inspired. He then says that he did research and read somewhere that people watch movies more than they watch plays. So then it just magically turned into a movie. Um, there was also a time in between those two things where it was a 600 page novel that did not get published, unfortunately, for the world. That just reminds me of model the story behind model in and model in was an a th- was a 1000 page manuscript that was edited down to over 500 pages and was still very confusing. Model Land is probably going to get its own podcast episode because we collectively have a lot of thoughts about Tyra Banks's model land. Stay tuned. <laughs> Before Tommy wrote The Room, he may, tried to make another film he wrote called The Vampire of Alcatraz, The King of Vampires. For some reason, no one wanted to make this movie. I don't know why. I feel like that's the greatest missed opportunity of all time. <laughs> I would love to see what that movie looks like. We need to go back in time. Again. Go back <laughs> further. Wait. <laughs> we must go back even further. Further, into the even past. further beyond. <laughs> Plus Ultra. Oh, my God. So, okay, let's get into talking about pre-production, like getting ready to make this movie, right? They finally, Tommy says, fuck it, I'm going to make this movie because I want to act. I think this movie's good. Good for him. You know, all all indie filmmakers, you know, need that push. Um, All of them need the confidence that Tommy Wiseau has to make movies. Um, So Tommy was the president. Founder, CEO, treasurer, legal department, brand manager, admin assistant. He used a fake name to be the admin assistant. Um, it was John, by the way. He wouldn't he wouldn't be the admin assistant under his own name because that would be silly. Um, and he answered the phones and opened the mail um, for Wiseo Productions. This was his production company or Wiseo Films, I think is the correct name for it. Um, it, it the name is arbitrary because when we say production... <laughs> Tommy Wiseau was making a movie um, and he said it was a production, but it was really just Tommy Wiseau. Um, He claimed to have four other financial backers for the room, but literally no one had ever met them, including Greg, who Tommy tried to make the vice president of his production company by not paying him for it and printing business cards with his new title on them. Greg declined. (laughs) Uh, Greg declined this amazing opportunity can you imagine if I was just like, hey, Greg, I'm going to make you vice president of Seldom Science Studios. And you're like, what does that entail, Avery? And you're like, and I'm like, well, not, you don't get paid, but I made these business cards to try to pressure you into being there. Um, so you'll be there, right? It's just like, poor Greg is just like, no, 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 thank you. I, um, I, um, in fact, Greg talks later about, um, the, the, um, there were there were multiple people that basically fought over um, credits for directing the room because Tommy was not um, an experienced director. So a lot of other people had to kind of like a couple other people had to take control. Uh, Greg, um, Greg, in his book, to paraphrase him, um, likens fighting over having credit for directing the room as fighting over over having credit for being the Hindenburg's, like, pilot, basically, to paraphrase him, basically. Um, because the room was was that much of a disaster. Greg is like, <laughs> why would you want credit for this, right? Why, why do you... You don't want credit for this. <laughs> um, and the credits were kind of arbitrary because, like, 
They credited people under the wrong names. They credited people who had nothing to do with the movie. Like under producers, one of the people that's credited was um, Tommy's English as a second language coach that never set foot on set and didn't have anything to do with the movie and was apparently very surprised that she was in the credits somehow. Um, Another guy was credited as being a producer, even though he had passed away before they even went into pre-production. Like... No. So the credits kind of mean nothing when you watch the room, just like everything else in the room. The credits mean nothing. <laughs> oh um, no! I know. Um, one of the one of the actors is credited under the wrong name because um, <laughs> Tommy forgot what his real name was, <laughs> so he credited him as the first name of his character and then his last name. Oh, oh we'll get what? back to that. We'll circle back to that. Um, oh my gosh! Casting. Casting for this movie took months longer than it should have. Apparently, Tommy had to reassure certain actors trying out for roles that the room wasn't porn. They they were like, are we sure? And he's like, no, it's not porn. It's real legitimate Hollywood movie. And they're like, are you sure, though? Imagine how bad the production has to be before you're literally sitting there being like, am I making porn right now? (laughs) Should I back out of this now or later? Yeah. Um, Greg... Um, Greg did not want to play Mark, who he went on to play. Greg, um, Greg wanted no part of this, basically. <laughs> um, he tried to politely tell his. I just hit the microphone and Spencer is giving me a very stern look. Greg basically tried to tell his friend politely, look, this movie is shite. Like, it's it's really, <laughs> really bad. And Tommy would not listen. And Tommy was adamant not only that this was a good movie but that the character of mark who by the way is the best friend of tommy's character johnny and he's sleeping with johnny's fiance um he insisted that he wrote that part specifically for greg so greg had to play the part it just reminds me of one time um i had a friend who wanted me to be in their film and they were trying to basically pitch this character to me. And they said, well, you know, she's really naive. She's not that smart. You know, she's scared of everything. I wrote the part specifically for you. And I thought in my brain, fuck off. <laughs> I, was, I was just like, you know, when somebody offends you, but they have no clue how much they've offended you. It was one of those moments. And I'm just like, oh, oh, poor Greg. This character that cheats, that's having an affair with his best friend's girl behind his back. I wrote it about you. Maybe he had like a bad dream or something. He's like, you would totally do this to me. I mean, Tommy claims that he wrote the plot of the room after an experience that he had with a girl who was like he was serious about. And then she, in his words, betrayed him. But he won't go into more details. So it's just like, you know, who knows, really? (laughs) Um, But Greg was not exactly flattered by this and kept saying, no, I don't want to be in this movie mostly because he didn't even think it would get finished. Um, Boy, was he wrong. The night before, this is the night before they start... I hit the microphone again, didn't I? Sorry, Spencer. (laughs) This is the night before they are set to start, like, filming, like, principal production. Um, Tommy's still trying to get Greg to sign on to be the... basically the other main character. Um, They have already contracted another worker another actor to play this part. His name is Dan. Although um, in my notes, it says Tommy called him Don and insisted Greg do the same thing. (laughs) That wasn't his name though. It was Dan. Oh gosh. Maybe his accent kept him from saying his name. properly. I guess Tommy was like, no, it's not Dan. It's Don, Greg. (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) So this guy has been cast, right? And he's planning on starting filming the next day. Um, And meanwhile, Tommy's trying to get his best friend to take the part out from under this guy. And Greg feels bad about this, Um, especially because like during casting of this of this movie, Don (laughs) had been forced by Tommy to show his bare ass on camera um, during during casting. Like this made Dan very uncomfortable um, this made the the person operating the camera very uncomfortable. Um, that person was Greg because there was nobody else oh. to operate the camera. <laughs> oh, poor Greg. <laughs> so Greg is just already over it and hasn't really even started yet. Um, Greg was made the line producer of the film, which basically means he's dealing with scheduling and all those things. 
Greg didn't know what a line producer was when he was given the job of being a line producer. So to due to no fault of Greg's, like scheduling did not go well on this set. And Greg was like already before they even started, he had been through like scheduling all of these meetings and auditions and Tommy. He was dealing with Tommy and, you know, it was just a mess and he didn't want any part of it. Um, so the night before filming begins, Tommy drags him to this really fancy restaurant, this really fancy restaurant where like all of these famous people in L.A. constantly are. And he basically gets them in without a reservation because he just kind of goes up to the to the hostess and it's just like uh, gives like a generic name. And she says, sorry, there's nobody here with that name. And he goes, oh, I'm sorry. It was actually this name. Again, nothing. Third try. He's like, oh, it's this generic name. It's John. And she's just like, I guess maybe just because she's tired of dealing with him. She's like, OK, fine. There's a there's a John on this list. You can go. And so he insists on being sat in a booth. They sit in a booth. He insists on getting a hot water that just a hot water that he doesn't drink. Um, and basically, Tommy is just Tommy, which is he is a menace to society kind of everywhere he goes. Um um after you know he and he's he's talking to greg about being in the movie still and you know after this dinner he pays somehow with a credit card that isn't working um it, like it seems that tommy's credit cards sporadically are accepted <laughs> from what from what i could tell it was like it's not working but then like some other card works or like tommy's again we don't shady with his money we don't know we just know that he has money but we don't know anything about the money um so after this uh greg says he he to, tommy paid with uh, some credit card but greg paid the way that he always did which was by apologizing to everybody that's how he says he paid when he would go out anywhere with tommy so they leave Tommy's driving them home 20 miles under the speed limit um, in a car that, by the way, he wouldn't let the valet park because he was afraid that he was going to fart in his car. I don't know. That's just what Greg says. Um, and as he's driving 20 miles under the speed limit in this hopefully unfarted in car, um, he's he's trying to get he's talking to Greg about the movie and he wants him to do this part and he's like swerving in and out of traffic and he finally tells him like look I'll pay you really good money if you if you do this part and he's like but you're already paying me and it's not that great of money and he's like no but I'll pay you x amount of money and Greg has never said like how much money it was but apparently it was a lot of money and Greg basically was being forced with the choice of leaving LA because he didn't have any money and going back home to his parents and admitting that he couldn't be an actor or taking the shitty job with Tommy and having enough. And Tommy said he would buy him a new car. So he'd have a new car and all this money so he could stay in LA and keep trying to do what he wanted to do. So he kind of was like, all right, fine. I'll suck it up and I'll do this job. Um, keep in mind, this is like late at night, the night before filming, and another guy is about to show up in just a few hours to play this character. Um, Tommy's big. Um, solution to this problem is, hey, um, <laughs> let's get there in the morning and we'll tell everybody that you, who we've told is just an intern, I don't think people really understood the, the, the gravity of like how much Greg knew Tommy at first. Um, basically, he was like, hey, so Greg, what we're going to do is we're going to get in there. We're going to huddle everybody up. And I'm going to tell people that the mysterious producers that nobody has met want to see you, Greg, on camera for some future project. <laughs> and then we're going to have you film the first scenes as Mark. And he's like, but what about when Don <laughs> asks about his scenes? And Tommy, Tommy's idea was basically we'll figure it out. What it ended up being was Tommy was just not rolling the camera on Don's scenes. Like, Don did scenes that he thought were scenes, but there was no camera rolling, and it was all just to pacify him because Tommy did not want to fire this guy for some reason. Again, we'll get back to that. <laughs> Poor Don. <laughs> so, Greg, with this new role, that he, this new role that he's been cast in, he picks up Tommy 
the next morning at his house. And he says that he was always on Tommy trying to kid him to be on time, which he usually never was because Tommy is a total night owl, which I feel called out. I'm also a total (laughs) night owl. But like Tommy apparently would like go to bed at like three in the afternoon and like wake up at like nine or something like that. It was like basically he was totally nocturnal. He was not good at being up early in the morning, but he insisted every single day that they had early morning call times because it was a first class production that they were running that he was always late to. Oh, um, Greg shows up to take Tommy to their first day of filming and he, Tommy is still asleep. Like Greg has to go into his room because at this point, Greg has moved out and is not living with him anymore. He's living with his girlfriend who doesn't like Tommy. Can't imagine why. Um, and Tommy is, he literally has to go into his house, go into his bedroom and wake him up. And Tommy's like, yeah, five more minutes. So he sits on his couch and he waits for Tommy for like a while. And he finally realizes like, this is taking a while. And he realizes Tommy comes out of the bathroom with like gloves and black hair color all over his hands. And he realizes he's dyeing his hair like as they need to be leaving the house. So this brings us to where we started, where I said, hey, we're all here. But the director is like multiple hours late. Um, that was why was he was re dyeing his jet black hair, jet black again. So he was very late, but his hair was on point, I guess. <laughs> so they had that going for him. So again, they show up, and oh, fun thing about Mark's character, um, the character of Mark. I mean, the character that Greg plays. Um, Tommy Wiseau named him after <laughs> Mark Damon, that actor. Who who is Mark Damon? Matt Matt Damon. Oh, Matt because Damon. Tommy okay. Wiseau thought Mar- Matt Damon's name was Mark Damon and just named the character Mark because he thought that was Matt Damon's name. Oh gosh. <laughs> so anyway, here we are on set. Greg is about to play Mark, not Damon, but Mark. <laughs> just um, Mark. Just Mark. <laughs> like Cher. Like Cher. I think he does have a last. I think he has a last name. Do we know if do we know if any of the characters have last names in the room? He's googling it, everybody. Everything is fine. Um, <laughs> Are they all shares and Madonnas? <laughs> They're just so cool. They just have first names. Nobody has last names. That's a very that's a very the room thing to be like. Everybody just has first names. They don't need last names. <laughs> what are they going to use the last names for? <laughs> Tommy Wiseau is free to email me and tell me what he thinks the last names are. <laughs> if I'm incorrect, I would not want to uh, be incorrect. Or maybe Greg, because I feel like Greg would be... Or maybe Greg. <laughs> Greg might be a little bit more open to talking to me. Yes. <laughs> Greg, if you hear this, contact Avery. <laughs> um, shout out, Greg. We see you, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> You're amazing, Cre- Greg. We're sorry that you had to go through that. Okay, so now we're on set, right? Tommy has already yelled at everybody, lied to one of the actors. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, actually day-to-day of working on this production, right? Tommy gave very minuscule budgets to most of the departments, including the makeup girl who was shoved into the corner of the soundstage with no real workspace. She just kind of had this dusty little like not even like a little desk almost where she couldn't didn't have room to like put anything out. Um, And she was just shoved in the corner and she was supposed to be responsible for like everybody looking good. Right. However, Tommy did spend money where he thought it mattered, such as a $6,000 private bathroom for himself that had everything but a door and was partitioned off from the rest of the set by a single thin blue curtain. Sounds about right. (laughs) Yeah, you know, privacy is really, really important to me. I definitely would spend $6,000 on just a toilet for myself and then not even give it a door. Oh god! And flashback to all the times we had porta johns to use, and we see a honey wagon. We're like, "Oh, this is amazing!" And then so they're like, the "Extras actually can't use the honey wagon." It's like, but there's twenty people in line for the porta john. I have to pee. <laughs> we <laughs> ten one ten two why? <laughs> and then also, Tommy insisted on using a film camera and a video camera simultaneously for filming the room. Um. You and I both know this is never done. You're either filming on film, which is less and less popular now, but this was 2002, or you're filming on digital camera, um, which wasn't as advanced as back then. But Tommy really wanted to be a director who had done something for the first time. And even though they tried to tell him, like, look, you don't need to, like, use 
bolt. Like you want to just use one. It's going to look terrible if you try to, you're not going to be able to cut these together. He insisted on it. He also insisted on buying, not renting all of the gear. Also not done. Yes. If you're just listening on the audio only version, find us wherever you find your podcasts. Uh, Gabe is <laughs> giving me a very concerned uh. look. Um, because it's just not done right that's millions of dollars like you don't need to spend that nobody like name the biggest production like disney doesn't buy their gear because they don't have to because it's just not done you don't need to do that um but he did and he even had a special mount built so that he could mount both of the cameras the 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 film camera and the digital camera right next to each other and literally film every scene twice uh, this, of course, also not only did he have the expense of the two cameras, buying them, the mount, all that, but he also needed two separate crews, one to operate the digital camera and one to operate the film camera because there are different jobs that go into that. So double the crew, double the cameras. And at the end of the day, they didn't use the digital really at all. Like the first thing they cut was the digital because it looked awful because like you can't light for film and then have on that kind of camera just shoot and have it look good like it was pretty much unusual usable so all of this expense all of these extra people working was pretty much all for nothing but tommy could not have been talked out of it so that's what he did and that's what they did every day for the six months that this film filmed um six months this film filmed um yeah and it was not a good uh experience during those six months um hopefully the checks cleared they apparently did. Apparently, oh. again, people expected Tommy not to, to to like be lying about the fact that he had money, but he apparently had the six million dollars. So he got his money somehow. Um, there's a scene in Disaster Artist that's obviously dramatized, but it's like where the um, where Sandy is like going in there trying to get his paycheck cash because he thinks it's going to not cash. So he's like trying to get paid before that doesn't work. Um, which has happened to me. I've had to drive around and like see if I could like get Publix to like cash my check because I had gotten heads up that the checks were bouncing from certain productions. Gosh. Luckily, I've yep. never had that happen. But there was one time there was a, a payroll company that was audited, I believe, and I got a check and the ATM could not read it. So then I just went to the like taking pictures on Wells Fargo and that worked. And I'm just like, they're trying to keep me from getting my money. Yeah. And this, you wouldn't be really um, faulted for thinking that Tommy wasn't really running a first class operation when it came to being worried about being paid. Tommy did things like one day he um, was filming establishing shots in a really high end residence in San Francisco. And he got into an argument with a police officer who asked to see their permit, which Tommy insisted they wouldn't need, but they did obviously did. Um, and after a few minutes, the crew just packed up their gear and fled and just was like, well, I guess we'll just start from scratch because we've just been, you know, illegally filming and caught doing it without a permit. Even though the permit would have been like cheap and easy to get, Tommy was like, we don't need that. It's fine. Get your permits, people. Get your permits. I could tell you some stories about being young and naive and not knowing the importance of getting permission to film in places that I thought were public places. But like Tommy, again, is on. He's not like out here like with his buddies shooting. Well, he is, but he's not out here doing this like, you know, just for funsies production. This is like an employment where he's like, you know, spending six million dollars to like release this movie. He should have known to get a permit and he didn't so they had to flee <laughs> flee i believe is the um the words uh pack up their gear and fled was the words that i believe greg sestero used in his book um which sounds unpleasant to be a part of um talk let's talk a little bit about the script because <laughs> the script is beautiful <laughs> i love this the script is so great so almost no one was given a full script on the film like at all Except for the scripty Sandy, like who I was telling you about, um, he's in that dr dramatized scene where like he's trying to cash a check and they're like, no, this guy has tons of money. And he's like, really? Like Sandy, the scripty was one of the only people that got a full script. Um, he actually had to write several revisions of the script himself. He says, believe it or not, the dialogue we got in the end was heavily edited and there was stuff that was much worse and completely unintelligible he had to like rework it just to be able to like make sense of it that's how bad it was 
Uh, while Tommy was writing one scene with Lisa and her mother, for example, Tommy forgot halfway through that Lisa was talking on the phone with her mother. So then later on in the scene, she walks her mother to the door because Tommy just forgot that she was on the phone and just started thinking that the mother was in the room with her. So the scene starts with her picking up the phone and it ends with her walking her mother to the door as if she's transported through the telephone in some kind of Twilight Zone situation. (laughs) (laughs) oh my god yeah um also despite some fun facts about the script despite mark and johnny's friendship being an integral part of the story they do not talk to each other until 38 minutes into the movie um also there are eight instances of the phrase don't worry about it plus one don't worry about that one don't worry about me two don't worry about johnny's one don't worry about those fuckers and two plain old don't worries so very versatile <laughs> um um oh hi is spoken nine times oh hey seven times there are seven mentions of johnny and mark being best friends often at screenings of the film attendees loudly count these mentions so it's like rocky horror picture show where there's like a lot uh. of uh, audience participation um um And Tommy banned all languages beside English from the script. He physically tackled Greg Sestero to the ground once when he improved a line in French. And it's highly speculated that this is why the characters repeatedly referred to the character Johnny's love interest as his future wife and never his fiance because it's a French word. He apparently yelled (laughs) at Greg Sestero, no French, and tackled him to the ground. Oh my god. (laughs) Football! (laughs) Football tackle, it's so fun! Like... (laughs) We're having fun. They don't play football in, in France, Mark. <laughs> maybe maybe he just didn't like France. I don't know. Like, we're we're not sure that he isn't French. We're, we're like, did someone hurt Tommy Wiseau in France? What <laughs> happened? He's clearly got some trauma. Somebody needs to talk to this man. Um, even though Tommy wrote the film, he routinely forgot his lines. Again, I'm a little bit called out because I wrote Marley's Angels, which you were on. And I also forgot my lines sometimes. That was mostly because I was running on like two hours of sleep a night. <laughs> um, but Tommy apparently forgot his lines like a lot to the point where the infamous uh, I did not hit her scene. I did not hit her. It's not true. It's bullshit. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. Pretty much everybody knows that scene. I think Spencer can probably put a little clip in there. Um, That scene took over three hours and 32 takes to get, according to Greg's book. And if you look at the scene closely, Tommy has the script in his back pocket because he needed it. For for, I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. And it took three three hours over and over 32 takes. Oh, gosh, please. Oh, and I'm just imagining it's like, oh, yeah, it was all just one angle. But I guess they had to switch back and forth between the digital. And no, the they had them both on the same rig. They were running oh, at the yeah. same time. And, 32 takes on digital and film. And it took three hours and they didn't change the angles or did they change the angle? I don't if or? they tried. To, I don't think they did. I think that was all they could get. And that's why it's one take. <laughs> three hours another fun fact about that scene is that the outfit that johnny tommy's character is wearing in that scene um was actually picked up by johnny himself when the wardrobe person went to run an errand he just kind of like sniped the clothes that he wanted from wardrobe and then when they got back and were like you can't wear that he refused to change so that's just what made it into the film <laughs> oh gosh there <laughs> there are sometimes i'm sure a lot of extras are <laughs> or a lot of the female extras whenever wardrobe tries to give them heels <laughs> and they're like no i'm gonna take these slits no you're gonna wear the heels and it's like oh. if they told me explicitly to bring heels i would bring them but i would hide them in the bottom of my bag and a lot of times they would just be like oh i don't see any heels here's some flats but sometimes if they insisted on the heels i'd be like here they're here oh i hated wearing heels but once i knew an extra who um there was a um there was a We were working on a show and the wardrobe guy was not there. He was sick. I can't remember what happened. He wasn't he wasn't there one day and nobody was counting on us needing to have a whole new change because we'd been in like the same outfits for like days. Um, But we needed a new change. So our PA said, just go over to the wardrobe truck like you guys have been here long enough. You know what your characters (laughs) would wear. And um, so, of course, one of the extras picks out the brightest, shiniest jacket you could possibly wear. Um, we're supposed to be refugees in this scene. 
and and it was established by the time the wardrobe person came back. So like there was nothing they could do about it. So if you just watch that particular episode of that particular show, which I'm not going to mention, it's just a really bright disco <laughs> look in the back <laughs> of what's supposed to be the somber refugee crisis center. Uh, looks I, very out of place. And I get criticized for my red fro sometimes ending up in the shots. I know, right? <laughs> You're like, there are redheads, people. We exist. Exactly. And it's and it's just like, well, then stop making your show so bright if it if it catches the light really well. I'm sorry. So a lot of the film also had to be dubbed, speaking of lines being messed up. One, because Tommy would mess up his lines um, a lot. And his accent made it hard for people to really understand what he was trying to say. Um, But the other part was just that the sound guy that was hired, because this was a non-union set, there a lot of people were not were not very experienced. Some of them were, Um, but like the sound guy just allegedly just wasn't. He he missed a lot of stuff, so like there was a lot of really unusable sound. So there's a lot of places where it's very obviously um, dubbed over in post, and it like their lips barely match up to what they're saying, and apparently that was a big pain in the ass in post production too. And then under uh, in in my notes, I have miscellaneous miscellaneous Tommy antics. And it just says Tommy had a cold the day they shot this big party confrontation scene. He combated this cold by drinking half a bottle of NyQuil. This made him tired, right? That's probably goes without saying. He combated this by drinking seven Red Bulls, and this was right before they shot. So when you watch that party confrontation scene, if it seems like he's a little extra out of it to you, it's because he has half a bottle of NyQuil and seven Red Bulls in his system currently by Greg Sestero's estimate. Isn't there like a limit of how many Red Bulls you can drink a day? Uh, like for safety? Yes. This was not very not safe. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I, I'm asking this question after <laughs> hearing all this information. I'm just like, do not uh, do this. Do not lead by Tommy Wiseau's example, please. At least in the seven Red Bulls and half a bottle of NyQuil thing. Uh, Tommy Wiseau is kind of a built guy, so I'm sure like that wouldn't kill him. Um, but it did make him really loopy. He was really flying when they filmed that scene. And you can tell he's kind of like swaying a little bit in the scenes that they shot. <laughs> it's it's pretty rough. Doesn't he like fall over at some point? He or? does. I mean, there's a fight scene which Greg is like, yeah, he was actually really hurting me during that fight scene. Like he was really going for it. And like he got bruises and all kinds of stuff. Like it was really unsafe. I don't even know that they had. I don't know what was in there in the way of safety. Um, there were a lot of injuries on the set, so we'll get to that in a second. So I feel like the safety wasn't very managed. Um, but, um, you know, it's not just you. If you're like, Tommy seems a little extra out of it in that scene. (laughs) It's the NyQuil and the Red Bulls. Um, now, very briefly, I promise, because this is a big part, unfortunately, of the room. And if you are watching with small children or you're my parents, just skip ahead for like five (laughs) minutes. I need to briefly talk about the sex scenes in in the room. Sex scenes make up about 10 percent of the room's runtime and they're all super awkward. Um, yeah, it. mm, Yeah, like, I mean, uh, everybody was a consenting adult. Like, I'm not I'm not, you know, just what. But the sex scenes are just very awkward. Um like everything else in the room. And for some reason, Tommy thought 10% of the movie needed to just be sex scenes. Um, Also, like when you're filming like a love scene, they obviously typically call for like a closed set, which basically if you're not in the industry, just means the actors and literally anybody who absolutely has to be there is there and everybody else is out to like give them privacy because you don't want people just like milling around in the middle of that. It's awkward, right? Um, Tommy didn't do this. At all. There was a completely, like, open set during this very vulnerable situation, um, which is obviously not good. He also ended up cutting the absurdly long sex scene that they filmed in half because he was like, oh, this sex scene is good. I think there should be another sex scene. So he just cut it in half and used the other half as if it's a completely different scene. Yes, that is confusing. (laughs) Yes, that is a weird thing to do. (laughs) Oh, gosh. It's like all those movies where they're like, well, let's make one book, two movies. I'm starting to see why he needed to tell people that it wasn't porn. Yeah, if it's 10% of the runtime, then it's just like... (laughs) This horrified his poor co-star who played his future wife. Um, 
who tried to, while they were filming, because it was very awkward to film, and you can tell when you watch it, she apparently was like, hey, let's put on, like, Alicia Keys and, like, make it more fun or whatever to try to make it less awkward. And he was like, no, we're not here to to um, represent other people's art. We're not here to promote other people's art. And so <laughs> that got shot down real quick. So it was just a super awkward, super horrible scene. And he, like, he also, like, made fun of this girl for having, like, acne on her back and chest like a very normal thing like he was just awful to this girl specifically like he was awful to everybody but this girl like the poor girl was like humiliated when she saw the movie come out like because he used like everything that they filmed from that scene it's like a huge it's very bad it's very not good that's like one of the things that's just like that part's not funny that part's just sad you know that poor lady yeah sometimes yeah Tommy also insisted on showing his bare butt in the final shot of the film. He he fretted over it, but he imme- eventually said um, if he didn't do it, the movie wouldn't sell. And one of the film's editors tried in vain to get him to later cut the scene because he said he had shown it to his wife and it had scared her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> um, also, there's a whole thing in my notes that just says the flying vampire car. Uh, One plot point, very quickly, one plot point of the movie that got reworked, though I wish it hadn't because this sounds amazing, is that Tommy wanted his character, Johnny, after fighting off a drug dealer, to get into his car and have it fly away Grease style. Why, of of all the things to cut, why was that cut? But Avery, where does a vampire come into all of this? (laughs) Um, When Tommy was asked why the car was flying, he shrugged and said, Maybe to- maybe Johnny is vampire and walked away. Because vampires have the power of car flight. Greg Sestero and the producer talked John- Tommy out of this idea eventually, but Tommy was sad to kill this vampiric darling of his and suggested an alternate version to the drug dealer fight scene in which they give the guy playing the drug dealer a real gun and have him fire it into the air to scare the shit out of the character who's buying the drugs from him. Luckily, they also shot down this idea. Um, And they ended up giving the actor who played the drug dealer a very fake looking airsoft gun. And I believe it has like the little orange like thing on the side. Like you can tell it's a fake gun. So it's like very fake looking. But at least it's not a real gun that he's just shooting in the vicinity of real people because that's not fucking okay. Um, Tommy really had some real interesting ideas. Um, Tommy insisted all of the members of cast be on set every day, regardless of whether or not they were working on that day's scenes. The set was also notoriously overheated because there wasn't proper air conditioning because they had one air conditioner, it broke, and Tommy refused to replace it. Um, um, One of the actresses brought up the fact that Tommy didn't even have water for the crew on this hot soundstage, and allegedly, he screamed, nobody in Hollywood will give you water, and chucked a bottle of water at her head. No, that's not a professional thing to do. I mean, I mean, even, <laughs> even, the, even at the bare minimum, the background get water. I had, a, I had a crafty lady stand up and say to the extras, water is a privilege, and she threatened to take away our water, but she couldn't because it's like a human right. It's actually not a privilege. Like, water is like a basic human necessity. Oh, gosh. I remember one time I was on a show, and uh, there are just a s- small little... <laughs> Sign, but uh, th- there was a little water cooler where people could get their water, and apparently on the nozzle there was like some mold on it, <gasps> and and they told the crafty people, and apparently someone saw the crafty person like wiping the mold <gasps> off with their with their hand, their no. ungloved hand. This is pre pre panorama, but still, <laughs> um, I, as I'm calling the thing because I don't want <laughs> don't want to get demonetized, but I don't know. But yeah, it was before that. But apparently they like wiped it away with their finger. And so someone was going around and being like, hey, just so you know, <laughs> don't Yikes. drink from the water cooler. The the crafty person wiped off some mold with their thumb. Disgusting. I hate that. <laughs> I always bring my own water. <laughs> um, Greg Sestero once had to call an actor playing Chris R. Don't ask me why his name is Chris dash R. Uh, Tommy's been asked about this and he just says it's because he's a drug dealer. He sells drugs. Chris dash R. <laughs> That's like CL and C dash L in Model Land. Like I said, that Model Land podcast is going to have to come soon because <laughs> that's going to be a that's going to be a long one. 
Um, but he had to call this guy back at one point to tell him that they needed to do reshoots for his scene. By the way, can you imagine thinking that you're done on this horrible hell set and then you get called and it's like, actually, we need to do reshoots. Can you come back in, please? Like, I've had nightmares about certain sets that are so bad. It's just like, please don't call me for reshoots. Please don't call me for reshoots. Please don't call me for reshoots. Um, but when he called this guy, the guy just asked, did Tommy blow up the studio yet? Um, because this is a good time. We've, we're have we already kind of talking about it, but this is a good time to talk about the fact that Tommy, he didn't really have a good repertoire with the cast. They didn't really like him that much. Tommy was kind of a dick to every member of the production, and when he wasn't being a dick, he was just being confusing. For example, Scott Holmes, who plays Mike, um, and again, he's the one that I said before, he was credited as Mike Holmes because Tommy just forgot that his real name was Scott. So if you look in the credits, his name credit is Mike Holmes, and you're like, oh, the guy who plays Mike was named Mike. He wasn't. He j- That's just how he, he's credited, because Tommy messed up the credits. <laughs> I'm sure in retrospect, he's probably happy that he didn't, his name technically isn't in the credits. Yeah, what is he going to do without being able to prove that he was in this masterpiece? <laughs> um, so he was 26, playing a teenager who was buying drugs, and they would compl- always put him in baggy clothes to make him seem younger than he was. You and I always have to play people who are younger high schoolers whatever it's not unheard of at all um but what was actually weird was that at one point he was also supposed to play the drug dealer he was buying the drugs from and tommy uh suggested that instead of hiring another actor to play the drug dealer they just put the kid who was buying the drugs from the drug dealer in like a disguise like an indiana jones hat and like sunglasses and like no one would know the difference (laughs) Like a YouTube sketch from like 2008 where it's just like people like one kid and they're like moving the camera around. Like basically he thought he could do that in like a professional movie Um, or like a Daniel Thrasher video, but like not nearly as talented as Daniel Thrasher where like he plays multiple characters. He tried to do that, but it wasn't a skit. It was an it was a movie. (laughs) (laughs) That also reminds me of Pitch Meeting where the guy is essentially talking to himself, but he has it edited to where... (laughs) Yeah, because that like, those guys are are very talented, and also it's a skit, so like that's kind of part of the charm. This was a movie. <laughs> wow, 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 wow. <laughs> Sorry, that's what they say in pitch meeting. That's why I did that. So remember how I just said that the set was notoriously very hot, and there wasn't really a lot of water provided all the time. Well, the actress who plays the main female lead's mother, Carolyn Minot, I think is how you say her name. I apologize if that's saying it wrong. Uh, the one who's like, I definitely have breast cancer. She's this sweet lady. Um, allegedly, she got heat stroke on set, but because she had always wanted to act and never really got a chance to, she gave it her all, even under these circumstances, and returned immediately to set after being treated to nail another scene. Like, badass behavior. This oh poor my woman. Gosh. Like, can you imagine? <laughs> oh, I got gosh. heat stroke. I'm going back, though. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I kudos to that actress yes. for for pushing through and doing that i have been on set when people got a heat stroke um usually just because it's it's summer in georgia and that happens sometimes unfortunately we're, we're dressed for fall slash winter in summer and oh, yeah. we have to oh gosh that reminds me of that one movie that i was on where and natasha was on it too and i i don't know how to describe it without saying what it is yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, as the camera's right there, like I think you can of... say what it is. Like, yeah, I think that's or, fine. But all right, <laughs> I'm always worried that the NDA is going to come up from nowhere and bite me. So, <laughs> all right, well, I will move on. So Tommy Wiseau was so hated by the crew, and he was so aware of it that he often worried out loud to Greg that someone was going to poison him and refuse to eat anything on set that he hadn't made himself. <laughs> you know you're a <laughs> shitty boss, right? <laughs> when you're like. <laughs> I'm just imagining him, like, drinking, like, the fanciest of waters and eating, like, the most expensive sandwiches of course, yeah. while everyone else is just like, oh. Two separate DPs and their entire teams quit the movie in protest over the course of the fo- of the six-month shoot. I'm sorry. Several cast and crew members were fired and replaced multiple times, sometimes for reasons as simple as suggesting that lines be changed. And to remind you, the lines were at times completely unsayable. So they'd be like, hey, can I change this slightly so that I can actually say it? And they'd get fired, apparently, allegedly. Each actor had multiple understudies and scenes were frequently reshot. In the end, over 400 people had been employed by production. The most, if not all, departed the film on very bad terms with Tommy. Uh, the actor who played Chris R., 
Uh, again, I don't know why he's named that, was forced by Tommy to wear his own boots in a fight scene. And when they inevitably got scuffed, Tommy didn't want to replace them. He allegedly shouted at the guy, I am not the Santa Claus. <laughs> not just Santa Claus, the, the Santa, Santa Claus. Claus. The one and only. <laughs> I am not Tim Allen, Santa Claus, and you will not get $80 boots. Allegedly, he eventually replaced the boots, but Greg had to basically be like, give the guy his boots, at <laughs> least. <laughs> Greg, the unsung hero of all of this. In one scene, a character named Peter. This is really, this is actually really fucking scary. Uh, in one scene, a character named Peter is visibly dazed and keeps touching random stuff. And he's kind of wandering around the room. And this is because the actor playing him had struck his head on the set spiral staircase shortly before while rehearsing and suffered a concussion. And Tommy wouldn't let him go to the hospital until he finished the scene. This guy also had to leave the film before his scenes were shot, and though he had given Tommy ample warning, he still did not plan scenes correctly, and he gave the remainder of the lines to a completely different character who just shows up randomly towards the end of the movie and is never explained after all of that. Kit, do you know how dangerous... No, for real, do you know how dangerous this is to be like, this person has a concussion. No, they cannot go to the hospital. Uh, <laughs> I mean... I mean, after 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 everything we've heard, I feel like that <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. I'm not surprised, but still, it's just like if if you're injured, see someone. Don't try to push through that. Yeah. By the end of production, morale was so low on set that crew members walked in and out of shots. The entire setup was filmed out of focus because no one had bothered to check the camera before rolling. People did not give a fuck by the end of this, and I don't blame them. I wouldn't give a fuck either. <laughs> I'm just like, are the checks still clearing? I don't care as long as I'm not fired. Tommy Wiseau had assistant had an assistant filming behind the scenes footage almost constantly. And Wiseau would spend hours watching the footage every night after filming, taking notes on anyone who spoke negatively of him behind his back. And when the original cin cinematographer, Raphael Smaja, I hope I'm saying that right, quit and his crew demanded to be paid, Wiseau attempted to retaliate by using this knowledge of their criticism against them, they confronted the conf confrontation nearly escalated into a physical fight between Greg Sestero before Greg Sestero stepped in and got Tommy to pay everybody. Like he would like he had basically spies. He had like footage being filmed so that he could like watch it back and be like, "Did anybody say anything mean about me today?" <laughs> oh God! <laughs> just imagine the background when we're sitting around being filmed and just watching that footage back. That. <laughs> And just, like, hearing what we're saying, it's just like, ooh. Oh, God. I've actually met a lot of sound guys that are like, what people forget on movie sets is that there's microphones all over the place, and people constantly forget that they're on hot mic. And they're like, boy, I wish I could tell you some of the stuff I've overheard on these movie <laughs> sets. That's why sometimes if you see actors, like, tapping the mics on their chest, it's like, oh, they're talking crap. Yep. If, it's like, they're telling somebody, mm, wait until the mic is off, wait until the mic is off, somebody's gonna hear that. Okay, right bef before I tell you about the disaster and then eventual um, r rise again of this movie as a cult classic, quickly, the sets, Tommy, um, Tommy had some interesting ideas as far as like what sets to use. They filmed an alley scene on a cardboard set. It's very clearly like cardboard cutouts, even though they had an alley set, alley outside, like right outside the set, um, because he said that's how they do it in real Hollywood American movies, apparently. Um, the same thing happened with um, when they were trying to film rooftop scenes. They had a rooftop that they had full access to from the soundstage that they were filming. Had a great skyline, apparently. Um, he instead did all of these scenes on like a styrofoam set with a green screen because he was running high class operation and quote, no Mickey Mouse stuff, which I find particularly interesting because if you've ever been on a Disney set, they're definitely they're definitely doing what's best for the seat. They're not using styrofoam sets. Those people have a lot of money. Um, they're not a, they're not afraid to film on a rooftop if that looks good. Um, <laughs> Green screen for days or blue screen for days. <laughs> oh yeah, they have so much money. The idea of like oh we're no Mickey Mouse stuff. It's like have you seen a Disney production? They have literally <laughs> all the money, like all of the money. Um, there are also fun things in the set deck of the room. For example, the main character has a framed picture of a spoon in his house. This is because they forgot to replace the stock image that came in the frame. So the stock image of the spoon made it to the final cut. Tommy has since claimed that the spoon pictures are actually a huge allegory for America's problem with consumer consumerism of disposable products. 
Um, but everybody on set is just kind of like, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that we forgot or ran out of time or Tommy was yelling at us so we couldn't really focus. Uh, they also moved these pictures around like behind them because they didn't have that much set deck. So it just looks like Tommy his character has like pictures and pictures and pictures of just spoons everywhere in the room. <laughs> Consumerism. So after this nightmare of a movie was filmed, he had to get ready to launch it, right? To promote the movie that he had spent $6 million estimated on to make, he put up a giant billboard in LA. Have you heard about this? The giant billboard? Um, he put up a giant billboard that became infamous in the area because it featured Tommy Wiseau's face staring down ominously from the sky and had just all of this ugly text that didn't match. It was different colors. It was people thought this movie was a horror movie because of this. They were scared of this billboard. Um, and then he eventually, even though people complained about this, not only did he leave it up to promote the movie, he left it up for five additional years. And people estimate that he spent probably $400,000 just keeping this billboard up. In fact, when they made The Disaster Artist to promote that movie, they rented the same billboard and just had a remake of the photo, but with James Franco's face on it, uh, which I think is a pretty funny move on behalf of their their marketing team, right? <laughs> but yeah, like he spent $400,000 to keep a billboard up that nobody wanted. Um, <laughs> What's $400,000? What's a, a couple hundred thousand dollars more? No. Tommy Wiseau also paid for a small television and print campaign around Los Angeles with taglines calling the film a film with the passion of Tennessee Williams. There's no metric to prove that he's not correct. He was passionate about the movie. <laughs> Those are words that were put into a sentence. Can they be disproven? Yeah, that's just marketing is, you know, <laughs> lying effectively. Yeah, <laughs> I'm kidding. Mostly. Um, despite this hard-hitting marketing campaign, though, the movie premiere didn't go too well. The cast and crew were reportedly laughing so much that Tommy allegedly left the theater crying. Uh, this scene is reworked in The Disaster Artist as much more of a wholesome scene where he, like, learns that, like, he still, like, brought joy to people's life, but, like, in actuality, <laughs> this was not a good moment for him or for really anybody involved. This was just awful. Um, he also... Uh, submitted the film to Paramount Pictures as a distributor. Greg points out in his book that even though it usually takes weeks for those kind of decisions to be made, they heard back in twenty four within 24 hours with a staunch no. Paramount Pictures did not want it on this movie. Um, the movie almost got pulled from theaters on its first day, but Tommy paid to keep it running in one theater so it could be Oscar-worthy because part of the stipulations, I guess, for an Oscar movie like an oscar nominated movie is that it has to have run in theaters for at least two weeks so he kept it in one theater so that he could say it did run for two weeks <laughs> <laughs> in one theater in one theater um shockingly uh he did the whole uh for your consideration campaign and won no awards for this movie however what? the disaster artist about how bad this movie was did win some stuff i forget ex i don't think that they were nominated for best picture i think james franco won something tommy wiseau got to go so in a roundabout way, he did get to go to the Oscars because of The Room. Um, the, the, the movie has since began, uh, become like a cult classic film, obviously. It's shown at midnight screenings. They kind of, um, they kind of liken it to Rocky Horror Picture Show because of the midnight movie thing. But I'm personally offended on behalf of Rocky Horror Picture Show because Rocky Horror Picture Show is hilarious <laughs> and knows that it's silly. Meanwhile, The Room is just like, this is serious Hollywood movie. And it's not. <laughs> um, apparently, two filmmakers once saw the movie when they were going to, in that two-week period, there was a sign on the marquee door that said like, um... The room, it was like a paper that said something about like the room, but then it said like it was handwritten. It said no refunds. Um, so they were like, oh, that's going to be a good movie. So they went <laughs> and they actually ended up bringing like a ton of people back to watch this. And that damn billboard had an email address on it. So people started hitting up this email address asking for the movie to be put back in theaters after it was taken out because they were having so much fun watching this horrible disaster of a movie. Um to this day, they play it in midnight screenings, like especially in L.A., like people bring spoons and they throw them at the screen. People wear oversized uh, tuxedos. People throw footballs at the screen. They <laughs> chant out the the famous lines and they count lines that are said over and over again, like, oh, hi, that kind of thing, apparently. Um, um, Cartoon Network also apparently aired this 
on Adult Swim, their late night block for two years on April Fool's Day, 2009 to 2011. So actually three years, 2009, 10, 11 for April Fool's Day. They aired The Room, which I think is just kind of funny. Um, And lastly, one thing I do agree with Tommy on is that Tommy refutes claims that The Room is a bad film saying, quote, this is quote, people say bad movie. It's about how you define how many bad movie I saw in my life probably doesn't, but I will never say it bad. But you know, if I have a conversation, I say, hey, I didn't like it. This is my style. But some people say the movie was it. It's a bad movie. And some people say, oh, it's a shitty movie. Whatever they want to say, you. Um, so it depends on how you express yourself. I don't consider the room bad movie. <laughs> End quote. <laughs> And I can't hear, hear me out, hear me out. I kind of think he has a point because in the end of the day, what is a bad movie, <laughs> right? <laughs> Every movie is good to somebody. We find that out covering stuff on this channel all the time, like movies that I'm like, who would watch this movie? People are like, I grew up with this movie. I love this movie, right? People love watching The Room, not for the reasons that Tommy Wiseau wanted them to love it, but they love it. <laughs> So I kind of agree with him. There's no, you can't write off the room as like, a. it is a bad movie, but it's not, it's not a bad time watching it. <laughs> so I will give him that. I don't consider room bad movie either. Um, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people might disagree. I'm but, sure. Yeah. <laughs> but here's the thing. It's like, I, it's in the interest of co uh, co combating like, snarky movie critics that are like oh these are good movies and these are bad movies it is worth mentioning that it's like yeah like everybody is going to find enjoyment in a movie somehow either, whether that's ironically or because of some like nostalgia tied to it or whatever like you can't really tell somebody like oh you're not gonna like this movie <laughs> because you never know right um so i will give him that the room is technically a bad movie but it is a very fun movie to watch except for the sex scenes, which I fast forward through because they make me uncomfortable. I'm, I I also am scared of Tommy Wiseau's bare butts. Oh, <laughs> I agree with that editor's wife. <laughs> Sweetie, please cut it out. I'm scared. Mom, come I'm... get me. I'm scared. So anyway, I wanted to tell you this as the first podcast because we've both been on bad movie sets. Yes. <laughs> Very bad movie sets. <laughs> Not so much exactly in this way, but in similarly adjacent ways. Oh gosh, whether it be <laughs> whether it be the weather conditions, whether it be the the people around us, whether it be the I remember there was one TV show I was on who the director directed a few episodes, and there would be times where he would yell, he would scream action, and I thought that it was someone sneezing because it was like ah boom <laughs> of noise, and I'm just like. Uh, but the, the episodes turned out really good, but the conditions were not so great. I was once yelled at by one filming a pilot because the director of the show was just like so awful and was like screaming at everybody. Like he asked like for extras like to be on these stairs and to be walking up these stairs. We rolled for two seconds. He decided that he did not like that. And instead of just saying like, oh, I was wrong. That's not the way it. I thought it would look in my head. Let's do something else. He started screaming at us to get the fuck off set. And it was so bad. It was the only time in my entire career as an extra stand in whatever where I the PAs pulled me aside and like with a bunch of other extras and apologized and were like, we are so sorry. It's not you like this director is a lot. Um, I've seen directors get into screaming matches with cinematographers. I've seen directors start pulling things physically down from the set because they did not like it and get into a little bit of a, a row with with um, with uh, set designers who had spent a lot of time making it look the way that it looks. Um, but I, I I can't say that I've ever worked on a Wiseau production. <laughs> oh gosh, I've heard stories about people and what they've had to deal with, and just the conditions. And <laughs> luckily, I've never passed out when I've done these movies. But there have been times where I've just been incredibly uncomfortable I, in terms of wardrobe i almost passed out because i was put in heels that were way too tall and like girls were passing out on this one set because we weren't given anywhere to sit down um and i was like i thought i was gonna pass out so i was like i tried to like make sure my knees were unlocked but somehow i rolled my ankle and then fell and then like was in like pain and then they were like 
they apo- again they apologized and they were like we are so sorry like they let me be offset they like realized that i was like physically in pain because it was like hour 14 i had been standing in these five inch heels three other people had passed out from locking their knees that day it was a big mess it was an overnight shoot too so like Ooh. everybody was exhausted and they literally told me they're like we know that you're booked for another day but if you don't come back we understand and i was like i did go back uh but they let me wear flats oh okay <laughs> and the wardrobe lady gave me a very salty look but the the ad was like look if they try to put you in anything other than flats come and get me <laughs> oh gosh speaking of salty wardrobe individuals i remember i was on one set where it was supposed to be like a like a quote-unquote hipster holiday party mm-hmm. and and so i'm like i come in in blue jeans i come in in a flannel i have big glasses so i'm like i could be kind of hipster i just needed a beanie but beanies don't usually fit my big head but i come in and and i'm like one of the first people in line and i go up to the wardrobe guy and he l- looks at me and he's like so or I, he looks at all my stuff and he's like so did you not look at the wardrobe notes or do you just not have anything and i'm just like Okay, so he gives me like this black button up, these black pants that don't really fit and these black shoes. And I only had white I only had white socks with me because I'm like, I didn't know I was supposed to be like dressy dressy for this. And so he's like, oh, we'll get you some socks. Cut to the wardrobe, the head wardrobe person going around looking at looks and they pointed at me and were like, just go back in line. You, You need a change. Cut to me waiting 45 minutes in line. Cut to me going back into another order person who basically puts me in the same exact look I came in in, except for with the jacket. And I and I and after I'm done getting redressed and stuff, I'm just like, oh, am I good? And he looks at me and he's just like. And are you are for the audio individuals, I I gave a really sassy up down look and then like a nod, but like a mm, kind of nod, if that makes sense. So luckily, I've never had to wear heels before. And if I were to ever to make a movie, I would say flats for days, everybody. It's a nice scene. I don't care. Flats for days. Yeah. Heels are just awful, especially when you're standing in them for multiple hours on end. Not fun. Very cute. They look very cute on camera, but also everybody's like, and cut. And everybody's like, I'm going to die. <laughs> that, or that reminds me of on Baby Driver. Lily James's character is a waitress and is wearing heels. Oh, yeah. We've talked about this. It's yeah. <laughs> so or it's like the sailors senshi where they like some of them like Sailor Mars fights in high heels. And it's just like that's getting modified because I'm not walking around a convention in heels. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if she's fighting for love and justice in heels. <laughs> fighting evil. But- yeah. <laughs> or I'm just but you know they're that's or that's why when or that's why they even if they're out of their heels they could still uh, kick enemy butt because their legs are just so strong from wearing the high yeah, heels the muscles for, it's every day's leg day when you're a sailor said she <laughs> they, they would be so they, they should form their own soccer team but they would like defeat everybody because they just kick the ball and just score a goal every especially time especially sailor jupiter she's like the athletic the specifically like sporty one like she could kick everybody's ass i think she could like 1v10 like a whole soccer team and still win <laughs> she's just like are you are what are you guys like not trying really hard because i'm uh, <laughs> you you guys are not on my level oh my our god girls, our individuals are not on my level <laughs> so on that inaugural <laughs> m- note of this podcast did that story give you anxiety <laughs> <laughs> gave me a little bit of anxiety it gave me a little bit of anxiety um researching it we should we should before we take our tardis back to the back to the future we should we should stop off at something important in 2002 Oh, we just... spent all this time on this terrible movie set. Um, <laughs> what happened in 2002, though? Do I need to do we need to uh, ask the TARDIS's database? Yes. What, what happened? <laughs> I, mean, I, I thought there was like a specific moment you're like, remember? And I'm just like, I was eight. <laughs> I, don't I was remember. six. Oh, gosh. Let's see what movies came out in 2002 <laughs> or the VMAs or some award show. <laughs> Significant moments of 2002. Googled what happened in 2002. <laughs> First result, the, <laughs> the room. 
January 8th, the No Child Left Behind Act is signed into law by U.S. President George Oh, Washington. gosh. I remember being in high school and talking about, like, graduating and stuff, and someone was like, what about No Child Left Behind? And they're like, what about it? Oh, <laughs> it's just like... Oh, January 11th, the first detainees arrive at Camp X-Ray, Guantanamo. <laughs> 2002 is a sad year. Maybe we should just go home. 2002 had a lot. 2002, there's a Wikipedia page. There's a Wikipedia page, everybody. 2002. Oh, gosh. Uh, I remember my first time being on set all the way back in 2015, which is 13 years after 2002. It was on a popular show that may or may not have... have, uh, I don't I, <laughs> with vampires and werewolves and we we did like a nightclub scene and then we did like a night shoot and it was and it was my call time was like <laughs> afternoon and my we wrapped at like early morning but I had fun anyway sorry <laughs> what were you gonna say Avery <laughs> January 13th President Bush chokes on a pretzel and faints briefly <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want to see, see that. that. Let's, let's go, go, let's go, let's go, go. We're gonna chop the TARDIS. <laughs> but thank, thank you, TARDIS. Yay! Yay. <laughs> We're popping over to where, to President Bush. Bye, guys. Once we Bye. get back to the future, be sure to like, subscribe, share, do all the podcasty things. I've never had a podcast before. I don't know what I'm supposed to tell you to do. Thank oh, you for right. listening. <laughs> um, you can follow us on YouTube at Gabriel Custic. And Avery talks about stuff as well. And we will see you next time. And don't forget to rate us too. Bye. Bye. (laughs) Thank you for being here. Bye.